instead of context. We have three scheduled presenters, Bruno Milanese, Ana Maria Vare, and Andrea Portela. Andrea Portela is supposed to be landing in Rio now, coming from Europe. I hope the flight is not delayed. In any case, we have two good presenters already here, and we start with Bruno Milanese from the University of Rio de Janeiro. Biodiversity, uh, water consumption, water pollution, 
เอร์พูดชสัมผัสเองเมื่อสัมผัสเอร์พูดชุดนั้นเราเราจะพูดถึงเรื่องของ CO2 ที่เป็นปัจจุบันเรื่องของการผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิตผลิต
But at the same time, this is uh, the middle of the natural food. This is in the close value resort. And as most, and there is, it's very particular and very important from the ecological point of view, because all this orange or yellowish dots you see, areas you see here, is called Tanga. It's a very specific ecosystem, a vegetation very particular of areas which are rich in um, iron. So most of the tongues which are here rich, which stay on iron or rich areas have been taken off for the iron ore. And these were the last areas left in the country. And apart from that, there's a very rich area there for ecotourism. There's kind of small lodges and tracks, track, climbing areas and all that. So there's an economy of women going there. There are people living there and it's very important and also for uh, water supply in five or six different municipalities. People who live there, they didn't want the, the mining to take place, so they started a great movement, a water movement called Gandarela, movement of water from Gandarela, to try to turn this area into a national park. And that's quite a hard thing to do. I mean, you really need to get a lot of information, a lot of data from the ecological point of view, and then come all the biologists, geologists, ecologists to explain how important it is from the natural science point of view, but also to explain and justify why should that be a park and not necessarily a protection, environment protection area on any other kind of protected, protected uh, standards. And they did a lot of research on anthropological and sociological aspects, economic aspects there. Uh, the project went to ICMB, which is our agency responsible for national parks, and has been there for two years. They're still debating because uh, the, the mining company wants these areas here for mining. I mean, there's mines out of the park, and there is a struggle here about where should be the, the park boundary. So this is a plot success example, but you still have to move. Second example, second story, this is Congonians, also Minas Gerais uh, state. Uh, and I'm talking here about CSN, Companhia Cerúrgica Nacional, which has a huge mine just over here, right? One of the big problems about C uh, CSN uh, mine is just that it, it is less than 10 kilometers <coughs> from the city, which is really, really, really close. And here's just a, a waste deposit. And as you can see, you have here the mine, we have here the uh, Engenho range, or Engenho mountain, or something like this, and here's a city. And the problem is that all the good mine, or good iron ore that says in head over here, it's gone, so it just wants to move down here. The problem is that this vegetation protects the, the city from all the powder, or all of the dust that comes out of the mine. In another perspective, oh, sorry, in another perspective, here you have the city, beautiful city. Uh, this is by Ali Jardim, by the way. It's one of the Barroques, Brazilian Barroques, the most pre prominent uh, artists, that's social science. Here we have engineering range, and here you can see the start of the mine. And what CSN wants to do is just to move down. Problem, first problem, first. And local movements really complain about it. They said, oh, that's going to be risky. That's going to uh, have a negative impact on our social life, on our part of life. And there was a big struggle between company and society there. They were not result, reaching any results until Copasa, which is the water supply company there in Minas Gerais, came to the battle. Why? Uh, the hydrologists now comes the partnership with natural sciences, scientists. They did some uh, simulations and studies about the impact of the mining coming over there on the water supply system of the city. And they found out that if the, the if they start mining on this part of the range, they, there would be a loss of 60% of the city water supply, and that was really serious. And that was one of the most important arguments that the, the social movements got to uh, impede the movement from the mine towards the city. It's not over yet, but it, it is, we, we are now in a stalemate, to stay like this for a while. That's, a, that's I would say, a successful story. On the other hand, as you can see, uh, this is still Congonhas, 
the other problem is particular matter. That's a typical picture of Congoians on a winter day. That's all particular matter that comes from the mine. And there's a neighborhood that is really close to the mine, and people complain that for the last years there have, there have been a, a, a significant increase on asthma, bronchitis, and all kinds of allergic, uh, allergenic problems, mainly uh, related to, to, to the drift system, lungs, and so on. And, but the, the city, the, the municipality, doesn't accept these claims, and at the same time, the company doesn't accept these claims. And we haven't found yet uh, a technologist who, and a social scientist who could help, help people to understand to what extent there is a correlation between this uh, pollution, air, and their environmental health problems, their health problems. And so, this is a struggle that's going on. Social movements taking part. Social scientists studying social movements, studying their claims. Uh, here we're talking. Uh, where is Julia? Is she here? Okay. Here we're talking about constructionism. What people tell about the environment, but there's to the lack of someone to study the environment to see how these things are correlated and maybe uh, the result of such a partnership would uh, influence policy, politics and policy and increase sustainability if you can find a way to improve the health of this people. Third story, just to finish, that's the saddest one I have to tell today and it's really uh, recent. This is Conceição do Mato Dentro. That's another city in Minas Gerais state. Uh, here, the, the mine was started by MMX, a company by, uh, that used to belong to Ed Batista, but now still belongs to him, but uh, he sold most of it. And now the mine has been sold to Anglo American, a British company. Uh, well, the story that you can hear about there is just really sad, I won't get into details. Uh, but there are a lot of social scientists <laughs> doing that research and following and taking uh, about all the process environment impact assessment there. I just want to talk about this little stream here. It's called the Passaset stream. There was a small community living there, about eight to ten families, and they they used to drink from this water, and they used to, the, the kids used to play here. Uh, the, this, the house about like 50, kilo, uh, 50, me 50 meters from the, from the stream, and the animals would drink that water. After the mining company went there, that was what happened. Yeah, and some of the and there was big big struggle between the company and the, the peasants there because there was a mission about who was the owner, who would uh, receive the who would receive the payment for being displaced, and some part of the family accept, part not. In the end, some people didn't didn't accept the, the, the agreement, they decided to stay, and one night, the water supply was cut. So that, that goes one after the, the, the stream was polluted, people would, uh, put a, a water supply system to get from the spring, and over the night, the spring system was done. The, the water system was just all cut like this. And that's about how unequal and how unjust this kind of conflicts can be. Uh, the beginning of the month, at the same stream, we had a lot of fish dying. Part of the care of these families started becoming sick. And the families went to government to say, okay, we have a mining company over there. There's something wrong. The water is getting polluted. And here you can see some of the family members collecting water to take to government to try to show what was going on. And they reply, and up even taking the dead fish and the water, the reply they had from government was simply, uh, you collect water without following the procedures, it doesn't count as a proof, I cannot do anything. So again, there's a missing link here, we need more partnership with natural scientists to go there and help these people to understand what's going on on the environment and help them to protect themselves from the change what's happening in their environment. So, three different stories, three different places, 
uh, I'm talking about mine, but it could be oil, it could be agribusiness, it could be eucalyptus or any other big project, hydroelectric power plants. I mean, as an emergent country, or, uh, or get a better example. Pigan yesterday was talking about, about how much Brazil sends of iron ore in order to import some technological uh, products. Uh, there is a, a whole discussion in the economic field about the industrialization of Brazil and how we are getting into our uh, in, the, in the international trade, we are just offering commodities and importing uh, electronic or technological stuff. Being a, a, a country that will specialize in commodities, we have to understand that all the commodities that export they are intense in natural resources. In ore, they are in water, they are in energy, and moving to that kind of economy will increase environmental impact, will increase environmental conflicts. So there's a big issue there to be studied and to be evaluated from both social and social, natural science and economics. Uh, moving on, just to my final slides. Uh, I just, I couldn't join you in the dinner yesterday, I apologize for that, but I was working on this because I just want to try to dialogue with things that were said yesterday. And I believe that when you talk about science for change for sustainability and the role of science in doing that, what I could capture from yesterday was that we need to build science that communicates. And we are talking about science communication yesterday. That, that I think that must be reinforced. But, and it communicates to governments, to have our better policies. We have to communicate with people and companies. I mean, we, we didn't talk too much. We talked about a lot about science for kids, science for teenagers, community in general, sometimes on both in policy making. But sometimes we, when we talk about science and companies, we mainly talk about technology transfer, how we engineers will get the new innovation trend and take there. But we don't talk, we don't see much, or I don't see much, maybe I'm wrong, I mean, there are a lot of fields over there. Uh, how social science and companies communicate and how we talk things like ethics and values and all that stuff can be is debated with uh, companies. I think that's important. Uh, we need a science that creates awareness, awareness that problems exist. Uh, technology innovation, technology innovation are not enough. And I think Blum, whose speech yesterday about climate change really showed us how it, how hard the problems you have to face. And we have the, the problem and pretty awareness of our trade-offs. We do have trade-offs. I mean, all the debate about uh, developed sustainable sustain development in the 80s and early 90s tried to uh, get out of the way some of the tra trade-offs like economy versus environment, society versus environment, or society versus economy. But there are still, I, I believe, that's my personal point of view, some trade-offs between private and collective, global and global, because people say, okay, we do need mining because Brazil has to export and then ensure that we have uh, a positive results in international trade. But how do we balance this with local impacts? That has to be evaluated. And between short term, long term, short term. And if we, awareness, if we really can motivate change, we can make people really understand what's going on and hopefully move on. Uh, Apart from that, so these are some, some of the elements that I think we have to bring into our research and into our, our science. And apart from that, for what? Something that really was a message to me, was really strong yesterday for me, was when we talk about Latin American here, we talk talking about inequality, inequity, injustice. So that was really strong, a, a, a very strong message about yesterday. And we talk about economic inequality, like global, we are talking about Mexico exporting less and less technological products because of the, the NAFTA we are talking about. Again, Piguet, we are talking about what Brazil exports and what it imports. We have local problems concerning economic, economic, economics. We have uh, social inequality, social injustice on class, gender, that was really strong yesterday, race. Uh, we have problems concerning social service, security, for example, that was... Uh, the guy from Minas Gerais. Yeah. yeah. Sorry? How yeah. Beato's speech. How uh, police service and security service serves some groups and not others. So this, and this is important. 
And I'm bringing today, just to add here, like, we were talking about sustainability, the economic, social, and environmental aspects, which have a global perspective, with sports, water, with, when we export soil, we are also exporting water, when we export aluminium, we are also exporting energy, so there's an environmental issue there, but also there are, there are local conflicts, or local injustice, that are really, really important here. And uh, again, I'm, I'm, I can't see Ju Julia yet, so I would disagree with the, her idea and what she said about, from, from back idea that pollution is democratic, no, I think it's not. Uh, I tend to follow more the idea from eco uh, political ecology, right? And that environmental impacts are not democratic. There are differences between people who are living there in Constituição Mato Dentro and Congoes who cannot move out of that pollution, and we who are here who, put, who don't live there, of course. And if we were there, we maybe would change place and change house. So there's uh, something there that's strong and we should bring that on our research, all these inequalities that I mentioned when talking about sustainability. And apart from that, science for with whom? Something that we, we talk a lot with uh, some of the social movements. Like, I don't know the better word for the poor, for the vulnerable, for the minorities, it doesn't matter. But the part that if there is inequality, there's something that gain someone, a few that gain and many, or sometimes a few that lose. How much they lose and how can you help them in improving life? I think I'm not sure if I was kind of influenced by half a minute by uh, Paj Barros' speech. Yes, about how you have all the both of the, the the cash transfer programs, which focus on who needs more. So maybe we should think and consider who needs who are the groups who need more science and not as an object. I will do science and help them and change them, and, uh, but science with them. Then how we empower these people to make science with us and help us make a science that really matters. Thanks very much. Hello? Yes. I enjoyed very much uh, Bruno's talk. I very much agree with uh, what uh, he has just said. And just to answer his, his uh, observation regarding the Julia's observation on the on risk being uh, democratic, I would say that uh, Ulrich Beck uh, said so in his first book, uh, published in German in 1986, but uh, he was uh, changing his mind. He has been changing his mind. and. In a book called World at Risk, uh, published, I think, in 2008, he talked about risk and power, and he said also that uh, those terms are uh, tangled, and you cannot talk about risk without talking about power, and that sometimes um, national borders help uh, um, make a uh, and visible the risks that are exported. We are exporting risks uh, from countries to countries and from the uh, present generation to future generations when we don't solve environmental problems. So I very much agree with Bruno's uh, comment. Um, well, and our presentations are in a perfect dialogue. I would say that he, he talked about this, protest against mining, against GMOs, against dams, against nuclear technology, against uh, oil extraction, particularly fracking, but kind of oil extraction, against uh, risk, uh, risky industries. Um, so, I would say that Latin America is going through a cycle of environmental protest using the terminology. Um, but you weren't here before. Sorry. Were you? Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, that Latin America is going through a cycle of environmental protest that is the coincidence of protest 
uh, that have a focus on, on the environment. And I will um, also make a comment regarding the word sustainability, which I won't use because it is a, it is a word that does this author, John Dreisek, who says about sustainability that it happens with this word the same that happens or a very similar situation that happens with the word democracy. Everyone is for it, but everyone is trying to define it in his or her own terms, using his or her own values and interests. Uh, okay, so I use the word controversy, but conflict is okay to, to me, but I use the word controversy because I studied with uh, Dalton Elkin, and he talked about controversies, this kind of controversies, uh, and, and she said that controversies arise when citizens in a community become aware that they must be at the cost of a project that will benefit a different or a much broader audience, that is the case with open mining, or out of fear of potential theft and environmental hazard, open mining too, involve questions of freedom of choice when government regulates. The, the, the issue of freedom of choice is important, and when science and technology are perceived to form traditional values. Okay, this is a definition that goes back to actually the 70s, not the 80s. This is the second edition of her book. So why focus on controversies? Because we can see that uh, we can see controversies as pathological cases that where you can see as what happens with a, with a biomedicine, or, uh, how normal, the normal functioning, what normal functioning does not allow you to see. The complexities, the dynamics, and the many actors involved in, develop, in the technological development. Uh, if you study and you, you focus con on controversies, you will identify new issues, new perspectives, and you will have to develop new theoretical frameworks. Um, they are very interesting because they induce the interaction between uh, natural and social scientists, between lay and experts, between thinkers and doers, and between local, international, and transnational actors. And they help to open up the decision-making processes regarding technologies facilities and natural resources exploitation, contributing to democratization. And I understand here democratizations as more people taking part in decision-making processes. Well, this is what we have been talking about. Uh, there are lots of technical and environmental controversies in Latin America. Uh, in relation to technologies, facilities, or the exploitation of natural resources, socially and environmentally risky projects, many times related to transnational projects. Social actors articulate networks with the transnational reach most times. Different protests get connected. This is a cycle of environmental protest. Many times with transnational reach, Latin America is a cycle of environmental protest. It's a sign of the cases. Um, I mean, the focus the focuses of the controversies, and I highlighted uranium and lithium mining because uh, that kind of mining had to do with technological change due to climate change. So, in order to solve a global problem, we are creating local problems all over the world, particularly in Latin America. Regarding lithium, uh, there's the triangle of lithium between Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. A large portion of the lithium more easily available in the world, the lithium that is needed for batteries for electric or hybrid cars, lies in a triangle in these three countries. And there are protests already. And uranium, of course, regarding nuclear technology. So it is interesting to see that when you try to solve the problem, we are creating new problems, and many times elsewhere. Okay, this is just the, the traditional framework of 
contention, pol contentious politics and social movements. This is for social scientists and for natural scientists to show you that there is a lot of theoretical um, work already done regarding this um, this kind of issues. This is about social movements and everything that is uh, that you find uh, in the in the literature on social movements and contentious politics applies to what is going on in Latin America. But I will focus more on what science and technology studies offer us. Uh, since the 1970s, science and technology studies have been working on this kind of um, controversies. So you have, for example, a lot of theorization, a lot of research done regarding the difference between the perception of risk by lay people and what is uh, risk assessment by experts. There's a lot of divergence there, and there, there's a lot of explanation uh, regarding why it happens. And many times when we talk about communicating, we are talking about this kind of different views. There's rationality too. There's emotion, but there's also rationality regarding perception of risk. This guy, Paul Slovic, has identified the um, the frightening characteristics, the, the characteristics uh, the, of the technology that uh, raise um, their risk perception. For example, uh, catastrophic potential. Catastrophic potential such as um, the one that you will find in, in, in nuclear technology is, uh, is a, a characteristic of the technology. It is not in people's mind. I mean, the possibility that technology uh, could cause an accident that would kill lots of people um, is a characteristic of a technology. Then there's a lot of conversation regarding site and dispute, the, the issue of not in my backyard. But uh, when you have a when you have people that are affected by a, a facility or a technology whose houses, whose uh, um, means of living are affected by a technology or a facility, of course, people tend to mobilize against it. Well, this uh, theorization regarding social amplification of risk and a complementary uh, theorization regarding attenuation of risk. And what is social amplification of risk is, okay, nothing happens, it's just a project and people are get going crazy. Okay, what happened with the pulp mills um, controversy between Argentina and Uruguay. But there's also attenuation of risk. And as we uh, saw yesterday, uh, young people are dying, not just in Brazil, but in most of Latin America because of uh, car accidents. And we don't react to that. So this is the case of attenuation of risk. Well, that's the, quest, the, 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 the matter of risk communication, not just from the promoters of the of, of project to the ones that could be affected by it, but also from the ones that could be affected by it to promoters and regulators. And many times we don't talk about this. There are conflicts of interest regarding the, the expertise that is used. Uh, there's a lot of theorization on conflict of interest. I didn't mention any author because there's so much written about it. Well, the, the whole theorization and the work on resistance to technology and technical controversies, popular epidemiology, uh, Bruno talked about this, people complaining about uh, health problems, but Statistical uh, epidemiology says nothing is happening. There's no more cancer, no more abortion, no more lung problems, etc. There's this, uh, these different views, and public epidemiology is usually when people go house by house asking, but you you have a uh, a daughter, cancer, etc. That, that is public epidemiology. 
Uh, and then this, uh, the, the question the, the, the of um, knowledge uh, created and knowledge non-created. And what about the non-production of knowledge? This is the definition of unknown science, and this is particularly the non-production of knowledge we part in this kind of controversy. And then science has been defined as the systematic non-production of knowledge, specifically the absences of knowledge that could have helped the social movement or other civil society organization to mobilize the intellectual resources needed to confront, and this is exactly what Bruno was talking about, needed to confront an industrial and a political elite that from the perspective of the challenging organization is supporting policies that are not broadly beneficial either to the general society and environmental on the environment or to historical power groups. Because elites set agendas, this is the rationale behind this. Because elites set agendas for both public and private funding sources, and because scientific research is increasingly complex, technology laden and expensive, there is a systematic tendency for knowledge production to rest on the cultural assumptions and material interests of privileged groups. Okay, so just to, to go deeper in, in the problem of, of the non-production of knowledge, which I think is, uh, is, is my, my contribution to this dialogue between social scientists and natural scientists, although I think this applies to, to both groups of scientists. Uh, let's go deeper in the, the three realizations regarding ignorance and the non-production of knowledge. This is what Beck and Wellen have written regarding this issue. They, they ask, are the limits of knowledge routinely and tacitly neglected or tacitly denied, or are they openly admitted and taken into account? How is ignorance or non-knowledge to be understood and communicated? As a merely temporary information deficit or as a persistent and even irreducible inability to know. Are we faced with known unknowns or with completely unknown and unforeseeable unknowns? And they talk about the politicization, the inevitable politicization of not knowing because there's a limit to what we know, uh, to what we can know. So they talk about the unawareness of not knowing can, because and this is particularly seen in these cases, science can never guarantee that the search for unknown effects, effects is complete, <coughs> so the gap is filled with regulation, so we put a limit to any kind of uh, um, risk, a risky um, chemical that can be, I mean, trace use of pesticides or a limit to exposure to radiation, but it this is this is very contentious because there's a gap of, that is still with interpretation. There's the intentionality of not knowing. Sometimes we don't want to know because if we have certain data, we will have to act accordingly. And there, there's the issue of temporality of persistence of not knowing. Critics of technologies point at the enduring unknowability and supporters of technology assume the relevant gaps are mo mostly specifiable and can be overcome. This is one theorization, then there's another theorization by Robert Proctor who talks about agnotology and, has, and, and says that he wants to question the naturalness of ignorance, its causes and its distribution, and to stress the historicity and artifactuality of non knowing and the potential fruitfulness of telling this. And he talks about four kinds of ignorance, as a native state, as a lost realm or selective choice, as a strategy ploy or active construct, and there's all this discussion about what uh, the industry is doing, creating doubts that uh, and asking for sound science when regulation um, is, I mean, the government or certain social groups ask for more regulation. There is, of course, military secrecy. And there are crises of ritual ignorance, things, things we don't want to know or to do because we find a society that, that 
with moral aspect to it that is not good. And then there's this third theorization by, by Matthias Gross, who talks about other categories and who thinks about of the dynamics of knowing and non knowing and knowing. He talks about nest science, lack of any knowledge, prerequisite for a total surprise beyond any type of anticipation. If we think of climate change, it is totally an unintended, unpredicted effect of industrialization. Then there's ignorance, he says, and it has to do with knowing about the limits of knowing. So when we recognize that uh, air pollution causes uh, climate change, the same with uh, the ozone layer, and he, he, he mentions the example of the first uh, attempts to eradicate malaria. Then he talks about when you already know that you don't know, you put that non-knowing into your, you can or cannot put that non-knowing into your plans. Uh, then the, he talks about negative knowledge, and this is the kind of knowledge that, the, the intentional non-knowledge, the, the things we don't want to know because if we do, for example, if we do research that connects energy consumption, water consumption, and jobs creating regarding different industries, the World Bank wouldn't be able to promote mining for Latin America as it did during the 90s, because it consumes lots of energy, it consumes lots of water, and it creates very few jobs. If you have that data, if you produce that data, you won't be able to promote mining for the region. Uh, and extend the new knowledge. Based on planning, you produce more knowledge and can lead to no ignorance but uncovering limits of gained knowledge. So, to sum up, all these three realizations regarding non knowing are, are um, illuminating to us and could make us think about uncertainty, about known unknowns and unknown unknowns or unforeseeable unknowns. To reflect on goal and interest, do we want to know? To reflect on matters of status that usually have to do with promoters and trust, that usually have to do with what critics say, matters of interpretation regarding standards of regulation, matters of science, policy, and funding, what research do we do and pays for it, and temporality. Are we doing research on what is not known? I mean, filling the gaps or not, once we have discovered them? That's it. Good morning, everybody. First, I'd like to thank Lisa for inviting me here to present and discuss these issues with you all. And uh, as I was telling you, I was wondering, oh, I will talk about poverty. And the topic was conference. But actually, there are, I, will, I was happy that we would finish talking about poverty. So I'll take the lead from there. And, but, but then I also talk about knowing what's unknown and knowledge, which it has to do with how we define it, what we want to measure for it. But anyway, so what, what I want to, what I prepare to discuss with you, you all actually is bringing, bringing to, probably most of you know, but bringing one, one stream of, of the economic literature in government economics, which is the axiomatic approach to poverty. So there is some group of government economists that have been, it's a long tradition, but has been now being very, very rich discussion given the, you know, the bit of data, of years of data, etc. So it became very, very interesting discussion on on how to measure poverty. And then it comes first thing, how to define poverty and how to measure And how philosophically you construct these measures. And I think this is one part, a very important contribution of, of economics and general social science to, to the general discussion and how we want to live our lives, basically. And how we can inform other <coughs> decisions as, as, a, as a society as a whole, which comes the normally and not the normally part. And so let's, let's scrutinize everything that we're doing. Let's have criteria and discussion and 
and what values we are imposing or or selecting when we decide to make policy choices. When I'm why I'm, I'm doing that because I don't know. Probably uh, Ricardo yesterday presented some great figures of Brazilian economy uh, evolution in, in poverty and inequality. But most of you are here, so I'll start with that motivation. And and I I I don't know. Probably you all, all know. There is this huge, huge anymore debate from Max Sattler that Brazilian income inequality has decreased for the last 15 years. And income poverty in Brazil, which I define later, has decreased as well. And, and two points I would like to, to highlight. First, that these new, let's say, this new middle class have bring lots of change in the, in the debate, of both debate in Brazil about provision of, of goods, environment, access to, to public service, etc., etc. But first thing, we have observed in many other developing countries the following pattern. Some economic growth, per capita GDP growth, which horizon across countries, you have uh, Brazil, Chile, China, India, Mexico, South Africa, between 1996 and 2010, the, the per capita GDP, GDP growth per year, and <coughs> associated with a decrease in income poverty. And here I to, to make things comparison across countries, I use the poverty line defined by the World Bank, which is uh, two dollars a day. People that live with an income that is two, less than two dollars a day, and then you can see that Brazil, Chile, China, India, Mexico, South Africa, more or less, but all also experience a decrease in their income poverty rate. But what is very interesting for our recent movement in Brazil is since we have data from 1997, sometimes we can use the sixth as well with our partial uh, census, demographic census of 1960. But since we have data from 1970, we, it's the first time we experience three co-movements. Per capita GDP growing, poverty declining, and inequality declining. In the 70s, we Brazilians experienced economic growth, declining poverty, and increasing inequality. In the 80s, no growth, increasing inequality, and a big increase in poverty. In the 90s, a big, a big increase in, in growth, not much, but a reduction in poverty and a stable inequality. And now in the 2000s, Let's say in 2010, since economic growth now has a little bit slowed down, but economic growth, inequality decrease, and poverty decrease. So first thing to say is that, that conceptually, for for economists that try to measure buildings, inequality and poverty are distinct things. Okay. Briefly say, one thing is how much income I have relative to other people. So I have two times more income. The other thing is how much income I can, with uh, the level of income that can help me command goods and service. So it means the level of my material well okay. So it's one thing is, I used, I used to, to say in general to, to my students, which is of course not your, your case, but I think it's a very, exam very good example. Uh, which society is more unequal? The people living in Manhattan or the people living in Cairo? Manhattan is much more unequal. But of course, there are much more poor people in Cairo than in Manhattan. So I think this gives them an idea of what I'm going for. Anyway, so that, that is the experience. But then, how, how, we, uh, how we define this type of poverty? In general, and our, our Secretary of Strategic Affairs, which I also belong, belong to the to the group that helped to define what would be the poverty line, what would define middle class. So in parts I am, I am, I am, I am I subscribe to all this, but which now I want to challenge. So I need in a, a bit of a challenge with that because I subscribe to that as well. But I'm not, not, let's say not challenge, but improve it. So it, it looks more palliative. 
But anyway, so how, how, how it works? In many comes to do the same, we do the same, etc. What do you want to measure, Poppers? We're doing a very simple way. We choose one dimension, income. And income can be, can be measured in many ways. The way you choose it, most of the countries do, United Nations does sometimes, and, 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 and World Bank, etc. We pick, we define a household as a common core of people, and we calculate, the, we sum up the income of every individual in the household. And if there's a child, no income, zero. And then we divide by the number of people in that household. That measure we call per capita family income. And that is the main measure that we gonna use to calculate poverty, inequality, how or poor. There are less poor in Brazil around. There are less inequality in Brazil around. In this single dimension per capita income. So if you do that, and these are the threshold used by, by the Secretary of Strategic Affairs to define what will be extreme poor, poor, vulnerable, lower, middle class, upper middle class, etc. Those are the values in monthly, in monthly per capita income. So in 2011, what would be extreme poor individual? An individual that his or her per capita family income is equal or below 91 wheels per month. Which is, I think is everybody would agree that's very low. Can argue could be 80 or 100, but it gives it very low. Then the discussion comes what would be middle class, would be etc. etc. But given these measures, what what we observe with given these measures, then we have a decrease in extreme poor, the percentage was 14% in 2001 to about 6%. And then what is what we put middle class, then people is here, there, but anyway, the fact that we are more people, we have more people here in the middle. Okay, now comes my my point to discuss with you all today. Okay. All right, but what is being poor? And there is there is this tradition among development economies of defining poverty from a narrow sense like that, low income, so insufficient income. And insufficiency of income can be still very arbitrary. Right? What, what would be considered a satisfactory level of income that would be a person would not be considered non poor So there are some, uh, there's in the literature, lots of, of suggestions for that. The one that comes on it, so you need income that's sufficient to buy food that is enough to to command calories so you do not have. So this is a very low level of, of income. And others know you have to have income that commands goods and services that would be considered in a given context a no poor person. So we include access to some goods and services that for this nowadays perhaps even access to mobile. <coughs> but anyway, so there is uh, for all this concept of poverty, I think we can we can organize the discussion in three components. I said. What is this unidimensional versus multidimensional poverty? So in the case when you look on income, which is the case of our definition of that I said before. But if poverty is can be can be thought of as a as a social phenomena that encompass many dimensions, many dimensions, which in a way we can use the concept of Amartya saying as capabilities, as a lack of capabilities. And individuals, what is a capability? It's the abilities an individual have to, to function well in society in order to live their lives they then. So it implies many dimensions, not only income. I'll give an example, being literate. Being literate is associated with low income because you cannot generate enough income in the labor market. We are reducing our extreme poverty. Now, all the dimensions of poverty becomes more important in which, particularly in literacy, for instance, or access to good health service, etc., etc., which in, in this case lead us to, to think of, well, what are the dimensions that could actually make a person poor his or her whole life? 
One thing is being having a shock, negative shock in your life that you can do or you have enough capabilities to make up with that and then and then recover later. But others, no, and then you may remain poor in several important dimensions to lead a good life. So that's what, what you call a, a, a long run of permanent poverty. And of the third dimension would be the discussion relative and absolute poverty, which is relative and absolute in terms of, okay, in the example I gave Mahatma and Cairo, a relative poverty would be, okay, I, I have half an income of somebody else, but the one I'm comparing somebody has one million a month. Another thing is to be poor in, in absolute terms. And the literature discuss which types of, of measure should have. I will focus on the absolute. I'm afraid I'm, I, I, so you get back with the okay. I, I have five minutes. Okay, so I have to rush. Okay. So why should you have poverty measures in, in this? And I think this literature of poverty measures helps the dialogue between social and natural science. Because in practice, it's already there. It has a lot of indicators for public policies. It used for targeting specific groups, setting goals, evaluating the success of failure policy implemented. Needless to say, well, let's look at the example of our Bolsa Familia. 13 million families, almost 40 million people. The criteria is extremely poor, 70 reals per month in 2010. Now it's just uh, updated with the inflation. And if you're poor, 140 per month. And that's it. So it's our per capita income criteria at this point. So it's already in place. But more than that, we want to evaluate and compare the well being of societies across time, across group, across regions. And building indicators, I think, is a great exercise and in an open discussion. It's a great exercise to make choices. What values we want to we wanna give priority in our policies? What dimensions we want to consider? What the weights of each dimension? What we want re this policy reflect, which you should include in our measures? So this effort of making indicators and make them explicit is that we impose for a, a choice for us and make this choice what the criteria of the choice and what's the choice for it. Open to the debate. So I think this axiomatic approach of the uh, of poverty is very good because they do exactly that. What do you want with uh, an axiomatic approach? We just want to make statements like that. Country A is poor than country B. For instance. So we want to make measures that somehow there is a, a, some agreement of the broader properties of this measure. So I'll, I'll, I'll go quick with then one of the measures that now which I think we have is the multi-dimensional poverty index by developed by Al Kair and Foster. These are authors, particularly James Foster, that has been doing this for more than 30 years. But there's m many more people involved with this. But I chose this particular one, which I think is good for this debate between social science and natural science, and how we would introduce new dimensions, etc. So I'll be very quick now in introducing this. I'll, I'll not give too much, and I'll skip all this, but I'll explain to you all in, in an example then. So suppose. First thing, we have to make some agreements on what the dimensions of poverty we want to consider. Income, education, health, access to, to service, or whatever you want, empowerment on the decisions, etc., etc., etc. So we have to choose dimensions. Once we choose the, the dimensions, we have, in a way, to, to choose how to measure these dimensions, indicators for, for these dimensions, and to define what would be a deprivation in this dimension. For instance, if you pick a dimension income, what would be considered a deprived person? For instance, a person that has family per capita income below 70 reals per month, for instance. We have to define cut off levels. For instance, education can consider somebody that is illiterate or not, that, that's easy. But political voice, how would you measure that? That then becomes more complicated. But once you have decided dimensions and the cutoffs to say from there you from there below you are deprived in that dimension or not, once we agree with that, then there is another agreement we have to make. So we have to make dimensional agreement, cutoff level agreement to consider deprived or poor or not poor, and then the agreement how we aggregate it on. Which weights we do 
what a way to do more, to give more importance in our indicator for income than for health or etc. Cetera, et cetera. That's another debate. But all has to be there. But the good thing is the their proposal is, is a very simple proposal that I'll give it a, a I'll give you just an example here that I'll show you to you the numbers. So here, just for an example. So I will consider three dimensions of being poor, standard of living, education, health. Could, it could be much more, this is just to illustrate. And suppose that for standard of living, I have available information on six indicators. The, the quantity of the household, material walls, uh, material of the walls, if it's, if it's a brick wall or not, if the household has access to hot water or not, if there is access to electricity, etc. For instance, uh, education you pick two on. If the individual lives in a household where the head of the household is illiterate or not, or if at least has one child between five and twelve years old not in old school. And for health, since we're using the Brazilian household service, in that we don't have a good educational health, but one stick with just one data source. So we, we chose uh, some indicator of child mortality. And there is some information on child mortality there in the household. So, okay, so I would consider poor, uh, being poor, all this uh, in this, these are, would be our three dimensions. So we have to choose between which importance in each dimension I will give, which I will consider more or less, and how I will aggregate all this in one single index. So there are basically uh, three, uh, let's say, good thing, two extreme approaches. One is, I would consider a poor person if a, a person is deprived in at least one dimension. So if I have there three dimensions, you don't need deprived in one, I would consider you poor. Another would be the intersection approach. You are only considered poor if you are deprived in all the dimensions I have. And of course, needless to say, that you can have a compromise, but again, going to be a, some, some, there's some, some adoptness here, which, okay, I would consider poor if a person is deprived in K dimensions, which is somewhere between one and, and the total dimensions, okay? So that's another another uh, <laughs> social choice, intersubjective choice we have to make among us. But what, when do we agree with all, and, uh, and, and with the properties that these, I mean, these index has to have, and I will not go with all of them, but just saying that what well, has, has to be an index that somebody becomes more deprived, this index goes up. If somebody becomes you know, less deprived, this index goes down. Has to be an index that has to be comparable across society. So we have to normalize by population. So there is this, this simple but important properties to make them comparable. When you do that, so I'll show you the numbers to Brazil that we did recently, considering these nine indicators and we grouped in three dimensions. So for each dimension, we're going to get, get the same weights one third, one third, one third in our case. And, and, uh, and a, a person is going to be considered poor if it is in at least one of, of them in our dimension. And here, look how the figures change a bit. For the per capita income, in 1996, we have 24% of poor, 90%, 4%. Now, we, of course, we increase the dimensions. We have 30%, 21%, and 15%. So, good thing is poverty in any the three dimensions is going down as were the other ones. But of course the levels of poverty is higher because now I'm considered poor, for instance, an individual that lives in a household where the head is illiterate. So of course we still have this, some of this. And of course the Northeast is has more poor than the good dimension poor than the other region, in the south in the southeast. And anyway, but and but uh, the evolution across the three years has been uh, similar to all regions, all, all falling down. And also we can look at separate dimensions, for instance, the only the schooling dimension, only the health dimension, or the living standard dimension. And for each dimension separately, let's get schooling going down, living standards going down, and the poverty, standard, the poverty and health dimension also is going down. But you can see still high, we still have let's say, in, in the case of uh, 
we still have more than 10% of Brazilian population living in a household where they had this sleeper. And we know this is very strong associated with health outcomes, etc. Et et anyway, final considerations. Uh, well, I will skip the first two that you have seen, and I, I want to then conclude that perhaps this literature in which uh, makes an act, this axiomatic approach to the poverty, in particular this multidimensional poverty discussion, could be very fruitful in, in, in measured long-run poverty in contexts like Brazil, where we lack kind of data that follows families across generations, that could see, okay, who are consistently poor, what are the dynasties that are considered poor. And so here, with this just uh, uh, cross-section data from all the surveys, we can have good figures of that. But more than that also, when you open this for more dimensions, it brings us all together to make our choice what would be our priorities in resource allocation, particularly on public resource allocation. And this could be good indicators for that. Anyway, that was my advice.